Hey, good morning. How are you? Where are you? Fine, thanks. Beautiful day outside. We have the weekend in front of us. Today I'm going to review the assignment with you, answer any questions. Then I will introduce today's film. Last week we only watched a couple of scenes from A Bronx Tale because that first movie was great because it had a dialogue entirely based, scripted, on the basis of passages from the prince. However, crime, Machiavellian practices, the mafia itself are not really the primary theme of a Bronx tale. They're secondary to the development of the theme of race and the racial interactions between two communities, African Americans, Italian Americans, and also the, topic, the, the themes of love, friendship, play a bigger role in that film. Today, instead, I'm going to introduce a movie from 1931 that established the foundation of the gangster film genre and it's Little Caesar with Edward G. Robinson and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. from 1931, set in Chicago. We're going to watch this time several scenes from the first part of the movie and then the conclusion, the last 20 minutes of the film. Next week, on Monday, we're going to read the first few chapters from the prints and discuss their contents. Then on Wednesday, we're going to present, discuss another modern books that tries to apply Machiavellian principles to culture and society. On Friday, we're going to complete the analysis of Little Caesar, since most of the day today will be the viewing of its scenes. And I will introduce the next movie on our list, which will be The Godfather Part One. In fact, by watching Little Caesar first, we can then understand what changed the kind of dramatic changes that happened in a genre that was dying, was the B movie selection for a theme, the changes that occurred with the coming of the Godfather trilogy in the 1970s and 80s that relaunched the genre with a new premise, with a new angle, a new way of looking at that world as the basis for nice stories. And in fact, the Godfather trilogy was an incredible success, even larger than the first movies that established the genre. Little Caesar is the first one in 1931, but, but within a year and a half, by 1932, Little Caesar came out in January of 1931. By the end of 1932, you have two more movies, all set in Chicago, all about gangsters, all about criminal gangs. Uh, the second one is The Public Enemy, with another famous actor from the period, James Cagney. And the third one is the first version of Scarface. And, as I said, those movies were successful by the standards of the time. We're approaching the $1 million mark in terms of sales of, of tickets, but their success was not as global and long-lasting as the success of the Godfather trilogy and of the imitation films, of, of the films that followed the rules of that. So, just a reminder, you have readings from one of the textbooks. Later on, we'll use the other one as well. A big chunk of the introduction, which talks about 
the prince in today's culture and also about Machiavelli's life so you have more information I just introduced some bits and pieces of information you have a more systematic comprehensive overview of Machiavelli's life there and then of course the letter to Francesco Vettori from December 1513 that I analyzed on Monday and Wednesday which you find in the book with uh, a long introduction with footnotes etc you have the first written assignment um, which is due where, where is it well it must be underneath I believe it's February 21 I'm pretty sure it's February 21 and again you find it underneath this screen it is based on a section that was already posted on the class website however the topic of whether or not to what extent a con a trick played by a scam organized by a con artist is a Machiavellian game that topic which was planned for this week will be covered during next week on Wednesday of next week so between now and February 21st you'll benefit from my model my example of the kind of work that you are supposed to do review the instructions in particular click on this link of the schema where you find what I put on the board because that is the terminology that is the matrix that you're supposed to use in order to establish whether a con is a Machiavellian game in what ways how and why and uh, the limitations in there okay and that's it for this part any questions about the assignments as far as the readings I put a tentative date but uh, it's important for you to stay on track follow the pace of the class but you know that we don't have quizzes or pop quizzes and the readings will be tested especially with the final exam and also indirectly through the final project because the final project and we'll talk about it soon will be an analysis of the connections justified implied or tentative between Machiavelli's The Prince and a modern day book which tried to apply the principles the ideas of Machiavelli as best as the author understood to the family to the work environment to relationship to corporate life etc etc and therefore in order to go through the paper you do have to review the prints you do have to find relevant passages you have to include specific examples okay can I have a yes or no yeah. I feel like the pastor in a congregation that mm -hmm. you're kind of a silent group and feel free to ask more questions okay let's come to the introduction of little Caesar these are the main characters of little Caesar at the beginning of the movie we find two goons two small-town criminals and in this couple comprised of Rico whose full name is uh, Cesare Enrico Bandello and Joe Joe Massara in this couple you see already who's the leader who's Gregarius who's the follower Rico is the leader because he's the most aggressive and he is clearly driven also by greed he wants to be rich he wants to be recognized he wants to be famous and the town around Chicago where they operate as criminals is not big enough for Rico's ego so Rico and Joe following the lead of Rico decide to leave this small town and go to Chicago where they go talk to a small mafia boss by the name of Sam Vittori 
and they managed to get recruited into San Vittori's gang. Now, San Vittori's gang includes several other gangsters. For example, you find Potero in several scenes. You find Scabby, which I didn't put on the board. You find Tony. And I put a star next to Rico, Joe, and Tony because these characters are fundamental in the movie for the development of a, a theme that is not really Machiavellian. It's very traditional. It's really, this movie is like a morality play. And it's a morality tale about characters who appear to be driven by greed, by their aggressive instincts, by their arrogance, and at some point, they come to face either the recognition that redemption might be possible, that they should get out of that life before it is too late for their status as citizens and members of the community and also for their soul, ultimately. And otherwise, if they don't do that, sooner or later they'll face the consequences and there will be a justifiable punishment. And of these three characters, Rico, of course, is the most unrepentant because he is biologically a criminal. Deep down in the core of a human being is a criminal, which corresponds to the assumptions and the ideology of a famous Italian criminologist who was studied at the end of the 19th century, even in the US, all over the world, really. But it's significant that every single one, with the exception of only one, but every, every single work, essay, article by Lombroso was translated into English within a few years, and his texts were studied in Anglo-American universities. And Lombroso was a Darwinist, was a believer in the idea that criminals are a subspecies of humankind, that if you study the population of a jail, you'll find few people who ended up there randomly because of their circumstances. And most, both in the male and female population of jails, which he studied measuring, testing them psychologically, measuring their body, he believed that most people in a jail are there because they were born with a biological, a natural inclination to violence, deceit, and criminality in general. And his, his, his goal, his ultimate goal, was to find the biological algorithm to determine whether or not someone would turn into a criminal. To be able, the same way that you observe a body, the body of someone who's sick or is about to get sick, and you spot the signs, and then you can hopefully apply some kind of preventive measure or a cure, he thought he would eventually be able to take a child or a teenager, observe the mind and the body of this individual, and establish with certainty that this individual could turn into a criminal, had a good chance of turning into a criminal, and before harm to society could be made by this individual, some kind of social therapy or psychological therapy could be applied to avoid that. Of course, he never found that. And the whole premise was, uh, in a way, bizarre from our point of view. So, three characters represent three possible arcs for a criminal. They all start as criminals. Rico becomes worse and worse. And of course, he will face, ultimately, he will face the ultimate punishment and 
he will be killed by the bull, by a police sergeant named Flaherty, who's after him through the entire movie. Joe, and, and by the way, talking about Lombroso, Rico, played by Edward G. Robinson, always has this kind of face. You see him, and you know he's a criminal. You know he's violent and aggressive. And his favorite, his trademark phrase is, you're through, he's through, Sam is through, Pete Montana is through. So Rico is unrepentant, he is being punished to teach you, the viewers. Joe, of these three, is the, less, the, the least ethnic, played by Douglas Fairbanks Jr. He's taller, slimmer, beautiful, handsome, and he is trying to get out of this life. He's trying to find redemption, and he'll find it. In fact, what is that Joe says when they have the first scene, they're in a diner, and by the way, the worst crime is perpetrated in this diner, the initial scene that we will not have a chance to watch. It's midnight, the diner is about to close, and Rico orders spaghetti and coffee. You can be hanged in Italy for that kind of order alone. So Rico and Joe are talking about their future. Rico says, we need to go to the big city because there we'll find the big game and we'll be larger scale criminals, more important criminals, more successful criminals. And Joe says, well, I've always loved dancing. Maybe I should pursue a career in dancing. And in fact, they go to Chicago and Joe becomes a gang carrying dancer. Well, so we see him in, in this nightclub dancing with Olga, this beautiful blonde woman, and then they go uh, to, to get change, and Olga says, what is that you have there? And, and of course, he has a small handgun because he's still engaged in the criminal activities together with Rico for San Vittori's gang. Eventually, even though reluctantly, Joe Massara will continue to collaborate with Rico. Eventually, Joe, with the support, the encouragement of Olga, his fiance, will turn on Rico, will call the police on him, will call Flaherty and say, I'll tell you about Rico, I'll give you enough to convict him. Rico comes in before the police because he's alerted that Joe is about to turn, but if he cannot find the courage to shoot his friend, and as I said, eventually will die. By the time he dies, the last frame is a big uh, commercial, a big ad on a piece of wood outside the place where Rico is killed, advertising with big figures and big letters a show, a dancing show of Joe and Olga. So they've made it out of that world, they've become model citizens, Joe has found his redemption, okay? And he's helped the law secure the elimination of a dangerous criminal. Of course, you have one who goes to hell, one who goes to heaven, and Tony is the in-between. He commits a crime together with Rico. They go rob a nightclub. During this robbery, there is a homicide. Of all people, they kill McClure, Alvin McClure, the crime, the new crime commissioner in the city. And after that, Tony is distraught. Tony is supposed to drive the car, the getaway car, and he cannot put the gears in. And then uh, uh, Rico even, even gives him a, a, a punch in the head to, to wake him up. And then, of course, Tony and Rico go uh, to their uh, place, the place where they hide, and, and they have to hide the money. But then Tony, who's supposed to go home, is so nervous, so taken by the remorse for what is done, that he ends up smashing the car against the pole, abandons the car, the police will find the car, and then 
will trace that to San Vittori's gang, that car, and Tony go home to his mother. And, and you have this, this scene where will say, oh, stay here with me, right? Comfort me, mother. Because he knows that he has sinned. He knows that he has sinned, but he knows that there is no salvation, right? Because he's being the accomplice to a homicide. And later, the mother tells him, I remember you when you were a boy and you went to church and you were at the altar with the priest. And he mentions, and she mentions the name of this priest. So he goes to the church. He goes to, 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 find, to try and find redemption. When he's getting up the steps of the church, Rico comes by with a car and da, he kills him. I don't remember whether with a Tommy machine gun or with a handgun and is killed on the steps of the church. And you'll see that you find here and there reminiscence of what you might have seen in the Godfather trilogy. But clearly, morality plays a bigger part. One character to hell, one character goes to uh, heaven, and, and Tony is killed before he can repent and change. So what is that you find in terms of the organization of the narration and also the, organ the, the structuring of the criminal activities in terms of context. The smallest context is the context of a crime. And we see one in particular. We see this robbery of a nightclub at midnight on New Year's Eve. Plenty of rich people in that nightclub and they, t they take all the money, the, the, what, what the nightclub has has earned uh, from, from that lavish dinner, we don't see the jewels stolen from the guests. We see the money taken from the nightclub. And, and that would be the context of the crime, where, of course, Rico has complete control because he goes in with, with guns, and it's very decisive, very aggressive, verbally and physically, so complete control there, right? Then the next level are criminal levels. So the bigger context in which crimes are perpetrated is the level of the gang of San Vittori to which Rico belongs. And of course, soon enough, right after the robbery, uh, Rico will take Sam's place. He'll say, we're not splitting the money in your favor. We're splitting the money in my favor, and you're done as the head of this gang. You can stay, but the, the, the guys, Pete, you know, sorry, Otero, Tony, Scabby, etc., are on my side. Okay, and, and so he can go through his career from committing a crime to being a level one gangster. The second level is the level of the bosses of bosses, right? And, and there you have Pete Montana, who's the boss of San Vittori, and you find a rival boss, Arnie, who was in fact protecting, in exchange for money, protecting the nightclub, and therefore a war ensues between Arnie and Rico. Arnie tries to have Rico killed, and Rico is only wounded, and then Rico will uh, uh, overcome, will force Arnie to leave the city, to, leave, to, to skip town, and to go to Detroit, so that he'll have control of that level, because of course, eventually, Rico will take care and replace Pete Montana as well. The third level of the organized crime, the boss of bosses of bosses, is Big Boy, doesn't have a name, just Big Boy. And of course, uh, it, it's clear that Rico has, got, has gotten to the level of Big Boy, and he hopes that Big Boy too will be through, you're through, he'll through, he's through. And, but he dies before realizing his dream of becoming the boss uh, of, of the entire organization. The other parts, the other contexts are, of course, society, right? But we don't see society a lot. We, we mostly see the criminal environment, how they operate, the connections between the various members. However, society is represented by the attempts by the police to control the situation, right? Stop these crimes. And, and there, the main character is 
the Flower Hair Theater is this crime commissioner and the crime commissioner plays a role indirectly because uh, as we'll see with this new tougher crime commissioner the criminals are supposed to behave they're supposed to be low profile uh, not to attract too much attention by using guns and Rico doesn't behave doesn't follow that because Rico cannot exist without aggressive violence and the use of force so he'll create a problem uh, so eventually Flaherty McClure will be killed but Flaherty will triumph over Rico now I added this dotted line to make you think already about the next film because what the Godfather Mario Puzo's novels and Francis Ford Coppola in the film especially in a masterful way will add is the context of the family so in here you see that crimes take, take place in the context of society but society is mostly represented by police in the other movies you'll see that family life the criminals as family members as fathers as as, as husbands will play much bigger role and of course the family intersects also with society and society will be much more than just the police in those movies just that and at that point the focus is not the crimes but the organization and the execution of the crimes but managing managing the relationships between these two world three worlds the family criminal organization society and, and it's all about managing and therefore it's all about mind games and there that's how uh, Puzo's novels and the films by uh, Coppola are more Machiavellian than this one so let me put on the first scene during this first scene we are in Arnie's office where Sam Vittori and Pete Montana and many of their accomplices gather together to discuss their best line of action now that they have McClure as the new crime commissioner and they have to come to an agreement that they have to lay low that they can do small robberies but not big things that will attract too much attention and right away Rico is not in agreement because it is in his nature to be violent to be aggressive he cannot play low profile at all which is what instead the members of the Corleone family will do all the time they'll have the muscle they'll have their Luca Brasis do the crimes but they, have, they are the, the nice face of criminal organization. And then we'll follow the characters until the killing of uh, Tony, the poor Tony. Okay, find it, 1106. This is Pete Montana. 